everybody, welcome back to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Fillman, mom, homeschooler, educator, turned YouTuber. And in this segment, this is my second of the day, I want to talk about kid activists. I will just lead with this. Before I go into the details I'm about to show you, I will lead with this one question. As you look at everything I'm about to show you, ask yourself, how does this improve the life of the child who consumes it, who reads it? I'm not interested in theories about how their reading it will improve the world. How does it improve their life? How does it take this little child at their stage of development, and we're going to be looking at things that are aimed at babies, preliterate babies who don't even have a fully developed vocabulary and certainly do not know how to think critically, who take the word of adults as the gospel. I mean, it's like God is speaking. So when you look at some of these things, ask yourself that, how does this improve the life of this individual little child? Okay. How to raise kid activists, 20 books to educate and empower our youngest citizens and their families too. And before I go too far into this, I would like to ask you please to consider subscribing to my channel and like this video, share this video, comment on this video, it feeds the algorithm, click the notification bell to be notified when I make more videos and I will continue to deliver content like this about what's going on with our kids, what they're learning, even what's going on in politics and current events and how your kids might be perceiving it or what kind of messages they might be getting that are trickling down. That's what this, that's what this channel is all about. So let's take a look at this. It's a challenging time to parent right now. Is it ever not? <laughs> I really want to know. I don't, I don't think I, I, I've met people who've told me it was a little less challenging in some respects in the past, in, in certain ways, but in other ways it was more challenging. I mean, it really depends on your perspective. That's one where I will say it does depend. But it's a challenging time to parent right now. Racism and bigotry persist. Okay, in the strictest sense of the term. In a culture built on unequal power structures, built on them, this implies they are intentional. They didn't just kind of happen because that's life and that's how things shake out, that their you know, power is not distributed equally or evenly, but it's built on it, built on unequal power structures. Climate change is real and its effects are becoming increasingly devastating. Okay. We're supposed to just take this like this is this is true. We just are reading these opinions. These are all opinions, by the way. It's a challenging time to parent now. Opinion. Racism and bigotry persist. It's a mix. In a culture built on unequal power structures, opinion. Climate change is real. Opinion. And its effects are becoming increasingly devastating. Opinion. The presidential administration continues to malign and endanger the lives of immigrants and their families. Opinion. With a capital O. How do you help your children make sense of all this? How about not? <laughs> I mean, first of all, these are all opinions. So you, you're, you, there's nothing in here that's factual. It's all your opinion. So how you're, you're implying that I need to help my children make sense of your opinions. I can't do that, really. And I'm not really interested in trying. They have better things to do than have me try to make sense of your opinions. Okay, I can't. If, if pressed, I might say, this person needs to read a book with some facts in it. But I don't even deal with that because my kids have other things to concern themselves with other than your opinions. Even if these were all facts, I would wait in some cases for my children to come to me and ask me to help them make sense of it. I don't see it as my job to go to my kids and say, let me help you make sense of things you're probably not even aware of on a daily basis. And it is not my job to scare the living daylights out of you. It is my job to launch you into this world, resourceful, resilient, responsible individuals, so you can survive whatever comes your way, climate change included. How do we raise a generation of kids to be better humans than our current leaders are proving themselves to be. Well, for starters, we be better humans. We just be good people. And since they're going to spend 90% of their time, especially in those foundational years of zero to seven with us, ideally, or with people we handpick for them to spend time with, I would hope 
We don't need to worry excessively about them being bad humans. But the flip side of that is, at a certain point, it's going to be beyond our control. So we have control up to a certain point of what kind of humans they're going to turn out to be. And usually, we lead by example. So, you know, how do we raise a generation of kids to be better humans than our current leaders? You're, You're assuming so many things there. You're assuming that our current leaders were made, however bad you think they are, by their evil parents. That's a stretch. That's a stretch. If your child goes astray, is it going to be 100% your fault? I'm here to tell you no, it's not. Probably not really at all. I mean, me some perhaps, but it, that that's an old canard that if your kids turn out poorly, it's because you didn't raise them well. There are things that are within your control and there are things that are not in your control. And as a parent, it's important for you to accept that. Um... Teach your children well. Oh, I try to live by a teach your children well mindset. But man, it's tough to parent from the fetal position, which is where I end up after reading the headlines. Where do I even begin? Honey, if you end up in the fetal position after reading the headlines, maybe parenting is not for you. Just a suggestion. So if you're parenting from the fetal position, there's your problem. There's your problem. If you can't demonstrate strength, if you can't read a newspaper, even if you are just exaggerating and using hyperbole, are you that hyperbolic around your kids? And if so, what do you expect them to do? How do you expect them to react to things? Is that what you want for them? Do you want them to read the newspaper and curl up in the fetal position? Or would you like them to read the newspaper and sit back and say, how much of this actually affects me on a daily basis? And to the extent that it does, how much is within my control? And to the extent that it is within my control, what can and should I do about it right now? Not Oh my God, I just can't even feel a position I can't handle the headlines. First of all, headlines aren't even necessarily facts. Headlines are headlines. They are crafted to make you feel. That's how they sell. That's how they get clicks. That's how they get eyeballs. So if you're already not a critical enough thinker to look at a headline and be skeptical and critical about it, you're behaving like a child, like an ignorant child who hasn't been taught critical consumption of media. So I'm going to take it on faith. This is hyperbolic, but even so, wow, hon, I'm, I'm sorry. I really am. And teach your children well. How about just set an example, like I said before, and getting into the fetal position from reading the headlines is probably not a good example. The books on this list will help you tackle those tough topics. It's never too early to begin teaching inclusion and activism. Is it though? Is it? I think it is. <laughs> I think that it is. It can be too early. There's that never word again. It's never too early. In the womb? Should we read anti-racist baby to our baby in the womb? Should we do that? Should we tell them, guess what, little white baby in the womb? You are racist. You have not even set foot on this earth. You haven't drawn first breath. And you are a racist, forever tainted by the poisonous color of your skin. And you will need to work from the moment of your first cry against your implicit bias that comes from the lack of melanin in your skin. It's never too early. inclusion and activism. Again, what happened to teaching by example? Are you planning to walk around excluding people from, you know, your existence in front of your little one-year-old and two-year-old? Why do you need to teach it? And for the record, you can't teach everything. You, You can't. If that were true, you could make a kid read the Bible from the time they're able to read anything and just make them read it every single day or read it to them every single day and they will grow up to be perfect Christians or perfect Jews or perfect Muslims or perfect whatever it is because you made them read these books. You 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 dealt with these critically important issues for them when they were a child that's going to turn them into those people, right? I think we know that's not true. So let's take a look at some of these titles, shall we? Okay then. Anti racist baby. It's a board book. From the award-winning author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, alternate title, How to Hate Yourself if You're White, comes a must-read picture book for the youngest of readers. They're not reading. It's a board book. Featuring thoughtful discussion prompts for families. Really, I'm sitting there with my three-year-old, my toddler, having thoughtful discussion. We're having a thoughtful discussion with a three-year-old. 
that borders on child abuse. You don't have thought, even parents who are teaching their kids Bible stories at the youngest ages are not having thoughtful discussions about the Bible stories, okay? They're teaching it like, this is so, move along. And we know that's what you're doing too. So stop with the thoughtful discussion. It sounds ridiculous. Anti-racist baby helps readers recognize and reflect on their internal biases and take actionable steps for a more just anti-racist world. This is a bored book. It helps readers recognize and reflect on their internal. How much internal bias do you have in your three? And who put it there? <laughs> like babies aren't born racist. Oh, I'm sorry. Ibram X. Kendi would say they are. <laughs> Where they got it from, I don't know, because they don't even realize they're white or black or they don't, they don't, they really don't see color. I, I can tell you I've had three toddlers and yeah, they don't unless somebody points it out to them. They might say like, why, why am I so this color and they're so brown? I mean, that's like as far as it goes. And wh- what you answer doesn't need to have like a dissertation. A is for activist. This ABC book is written and illustrated for the next generation of progressives. Families who want their kids to grow up in a space that is unapologetic about activism, environmental justice, civil rights, LGBTQIA plus equality, and everything else that activists believe in and fight for. It's a beautiful thing. And it's only $17.95. <laughs> the next generation of progressives. So you've already decided what your child's political views should be. Because this is political. It's not philosophical. So I'm just curious. If there were a list of books for, you know, the next generation of conservatives, do you think the progressives would be going, oh, yeah, sure, that's totally fine. I mean, absolutely. Let's give him his presence. Or do you think they'd be going, oh, my God. Okay. There's, there's no equity when it comes to indoctrinating your children in your own adult views that you had your entire life to arrive at. Okay. Well, we hope, unless you were indoctrinated too. It's creepy. Last stop on Market Street. Every Sunday after church. Well, they're going to church, so we have some competing dogma here. CJ and his grandma ride the bus across town, but today CJ wonders why they don't own a car like his friend Colby. Why doesn't he have an iPod like the boys on the bus? How come they always have to get off in the dirty part of town? Each question is met with an encouraging answer from grandma who helps them see the beauty and fun in their routine and the world around them. Do you need a book for this? Do you, do you need a book for this? And who is this book for, by the way, at $19 for a hardcover? I'm pretty sure it's not for CJ. <laughs> I don't think this book is for CJ. I think this book is for the kids who don't live like this to be taught about the little poor kids. And isn't that a little bit um, patronizing? I don't know. Kind of creepy, actually. Let's read about the poor children and how they don't have cars like you. Don't you think you can teach gratitude without the comparison like that? I mean... You, you can do this if you want. I just think this is a little creepy. I know I've said that a few times. I'm probably going to say it a few more. All are welcome. Celebrate diversity and inclusion with All Are Welcome, which follows a group of children through a day in their school. A school where kids and podcasts, hijabs, and yarmulkes play side by side with friends in baseball caps. A school where students grow and learn from each other's traditions. May all of our children go to a school like this one. This one seems fairly benign. I mean, it's just a school with lots of different kids. But again, I would ask, why do we need a book? If they are going to a school like this, they're already immersed in it. They're immersed in it. It's happening. They're they're doing it. They're living it. They don't need to read it in a book. This, again, seems to be targeted at kids who don't live like this, who live a more exclusive existence. Maybe they go to a Tony Upper East Side private school where 99% of the kids look the same and have the same income level. I don't know. But either way, I don't think it's a book. If, if parents lack the imagination to have these conversations or aren't able to teach their kids how to have values that teach the intrinsic worth of the individual and that we don't judge people by their their race, their gender, their, their status, their wealth, their class, or any of that, we simply don't judge people that way. It's not what we do. And if you actually physically take your child outside the home and outside your neighborhood to have diverse experiences, you're going to accomplish the same goal. A book is reading about something. It is not living something. Still fairly benign in my opinion. I just, this to me feels like, 
oh good, I'm off the hook. <laughs> I, I live in Brooklyn in our million dollar brownstone and my child goes to a $50,000 a year private school, but I read a book called All Are Welcome, so it's good. I hate to be so snarky, but that's kind of how I feel about this. Baby feminists. <laughs> why does this baby have such dark eyebrows? I mean, because why? Because it's baby Frida Kahlo. It's baby Ruth Bader Ginsburg and it's baby Mae Jameson. Jemison. In this board book, perfect for budding feminists, discovering what iconic figures, and then there's their names, among them might have looked like as adorable babies. We know what they look like. We've seen their baby pictures. <laughs> it carries an inspiring message that any baby can grow up to make the world a better place for all genders. Do you really mean all genders though? You don't. You know you don't. You mean women and trans women. You don't mean all genders. Admit it, you don't. You're not really interested in making the world better for white cisgender males. Admit it. But baby feminist, like, can't the kid just live? Isn't it enough to give them the paper bag princess and teach them that they don't have to grow up to, you know, marry the prince, they can slay the dragon, tell the prince he's a jerk and live happily ever after alone? Why do you need to be so explicit? I don't think it's harmful. I just think it is... It's just a bit much. It puts a, a little bit of a burden on kids to see the world as f so flawed and scary and dangerous unless, like unless I do these things, the world is not going to be good enough. <sighs> this one, The Journey, I think is actually kind of interesting. This beautifully illustrated book explores the unimaginable decisions families must make when they leave their homes and everything they know to escape the turmoil and tragedy brought by war based on a series of interviews with refugees. I think this is lovely. I really don't have a problem with this. This is an experience they're not going to be able to have or share. And I think reading about it would be, this is a good example of when a book can educate a child about what something might be like that they can't possibly have exposure to and yet they might meet a refugee. So, okay, fine. I still would prefer to have this be a book for older kids or kids who are starting to ask questions, I don't think you just, hi, little child who thinks the world is a wonderful place and the sun rises and it's sunny and everything's great. And, you know, let's sit down and read about the hardships of others. I think there's a time and a place. You can do that. And there are lessons where you can integrate things like this. I just wonder how parents are presenting this material. <laughs> well, we all love Horton Hears a Who. And that's the classic, wonderful you know, no matter, a person's a person, no matter how small, it's the ultimate individualist classic. So I love it. And that's a person's a person. There's no races in Dr. Seuss. There are no races. They're not even human. That's what's so wonderful about it. They're just individuals. A person's a person, no matter how small. Stonewall, a building, an uprising, a revolution. Um... This one is about LGBTQ. I don't know the age range for this book, but again, I think we need to be thinking about age appropriateness. Let's come down to the little book of active little activists. The little book of little activists is a primer on political activism. Why? <laughs> Using your child in protest rallies and things like that is abusive. You are making your child a pawn. They don't understand what's going on. They don't. At best, you are using them as a prop. At worst, you're putting them in danger. This is just straight up wrong. I took my teenagers with me to a protest this year, and I explained to them what it was about. They're old enough to understand. They have the critical thinking skills necessary to decide on their own if they want to be there, and I give them the option to opt out. They chose to go. But... That wasn't me going, go be an activist. It was just, hey, we're going to protest. Do you want to come? Here's what it's about. If you're not on board, I understand. You can't do that with a little kid, a little activist. You are using your child. And you are teaching them that your love goes with this. If they don't agree someday, the message will be clear that mommy loves me if, daddy loves me when. And that's not appropriate, in my opinion. I probably would get pushed back on that, but I don't care. Um, this one is about a, a little, I guess, a, a child who is trans. From the time she was two, Jazz knew that she was actually a girl. Okay, do we need a mass-produced book? I mean, 
I'm very concerned about what's going on with the trans craze. I really am. So that's a whole separate video. I'll leave that for later. But I think we need to be very careful because there are parents who are talking about their two and their three-year-old knowing they are a different gender. I'm sorry. No. I'm not a doctor, but I've talked to some doctors about this and they say that that is just not true. Okay. Uh, not even talking about Chelsea Clinton because it's going to take me off on a rant. Um, but Nut Buddy is an older book. It's actually really good. 1936, Flint, Michigan, Great Depression. And Wonder is a wonderful book. Brown Girl Dreaming is a wonderful book. These books are now we're getting into classic books. Some of these are for teens, Freedom's Children. That's great. The ones I have the biggest problem with are the kid activists. Kid activists. Greta Thunberg's book. And of course, yeah, I've already said I love Anne Frank. No problem about that. But I think... Parents really need to think long and hard about this, how to raise a kid activist. Why are you doing this? Is this about your child or is this about you? Why are you doing this? Who is this for? Do you really think that your little three-year-old is, are they, do you want them to grow up to be an activist for you? Does it make you feel virtuous or is this something that's truly going to benefit their life? Are they in some kind of turmoil right now where they need to be an activist or do you just need them to be an activist? And there's a difference. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll admit you know the difference. If you want your child to be a good person, be a good person. And being a good person starts by being accepting and inclusive yourself. And that means of people who disagree with you, like people like me. That means you don't call people like me a racist or a Nazi. You take the time to listen and you take the time to consider the fact that maybe other people have a point. And if you don't, that's fine, but you don't hate. And there's a whole lot of hate coming from the how to raise an activist group, that side of the world. If I say I think this is wrong, I get called a racist, I get called a Nazi, I get called a white supremacist, I get called all kinds of names. How is that tolerant, inclusive, diverse, it's not. So are you really raising a better person or are you raising the person you'll agree with so you don't have to have any difficulty or discomfort in your own home? And I've got news for you. There have been Go ask some religious parents who've tried to raise their kids in, the, in their faith and had their kids re rebel what happened there. So don't be so sure things are going to go hunky-dory from now until college. Let your child be an individual. When your child is born, they are who they are. It is your job to figure out who that is and nurture that little being and make sure that when you're teaching them something, it will actually add to their life, make their life better and not just reflect on you. Um, NPR, Ed, this goes back to 2017. Remember I said this goes back a ways? Summer reading for your woke kid. I presume to read in summer camp or at the Hamptons. Hamptons. I mean, who else is doing this? Who else is coming here and looking at this stuff? Social activist Inosanto Nagara wanted to find a fun book to read to his two-year-old son that talked about the importance of social justice. Two. The kid is eating his boogers. Probably chewing his own toenails. Throwing his food on the floor and crying when he doesn't get his way. Because that's what two-year-olds do. Social justice? How about the justice of don't throw your, your pureed carrots on the floor and stop begging for chicken nuggets? I don't know. I don't... I don't understand the need to have a fun book to read to your two-year-old about social justice. Is this really a market? This is about the parents. This isn't about the kid. The little two-year-old is not going, Daddy, I would really like a fun book about social justice. But a little alphabet book, just a basic alphabet book about things they see in everyday life. A is for activist. It's not something they see and can relate to. A is for freaking apple. Alligator, if you want. He wasn't looking for the typical fiction written for children. Huh, why would I read my two-year-old something written for children? Instead, he was looking for unique narratives by writers of color and or authors who can speak about social issues through their own experiences because surely your little critical thinking little two-year-old would know the difference. If you want to read a book about social justice, go read a book about social justice. Your two-year-old wants to hear about, you know, teddy bears and dragons and snakes and things that two-year-olds want to eat dinosaurs and puppies and kittens. And, and maybe that sounds... 
I don't know what you might think, you know, you're expecting too little. No, that's what's developmentally appropriate. Things they understand from within their little experience of their life. Tangibles. They don't understand concepts like justice. Never mind social. They're two. <sighs> he couldn't find any, so he wrote one. How awesome. Did he really write one for his two-year-old? Do we believe the story? Or did he write one for all the other people out there who think that they were supposed to read this stuff to their two-year-olds? I'm just guessing. Parents and teachers are realizing that what students read and learn often affects, is a two-year-old a student? <laughs> how they see the world. Yeah, it affects how they see the world, surely. But why can't you allow them some space to choose books and read books that are of interest to them. You want your kids to love to read. Not everything has to be a polemic. Not everything has to, you know, reinforce some message that you want to get across. And maybe the values it teaches are sort of really baked in there. It doesn't have to be so in your face. Um, Executive Director for Teaching for Change, an organization puts together social justice reading lists to inspire children through the summer. Are we really inspiring them or indoctrinating them? Are they inspired or do they pick up on, you know, the adults really want me to do this. And if I do this, I'll, that'll automatically make me a good person. And I want to be a good person because if I'm a good person, then my parents will love me. My peers will think I'm a good person. Being a good person is really the highest value on planet Earth. And good person is defined by others, not me. So is that inspiration? You, you be the judge. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, how did we get here? How did this happen? Well, it just so happens I found an article that helps explain that. How Kids' Books Became Universally Woke. Progressivism is the latest religion, and the children's publishing industry is cashing in by Ed West. Now, he's in the UK, I believe. Um, this was written in March of this year. But here's what he has to say. When I was a child and was dragged along to church against my will, I would occasionally fight the boredom by reading the small picture books they had lying around. They told the stories of the saints of the Catholic Church. It was quite the... It wasn't quite the X-Men, but reading about St. Patrick banishing the snakes or Padre Pio's powers of bilocation was better than nothing. Anything but the boredom of the mass and sanctimony of the miserable people around us. The stories were propaganda in the most benevolent sense, designed to promote a system of values that should be imparted down to children. The Jesuit saying, give me a child until seven and I will give you the man, reflects the importance of shaping values at an early age. I haven't been so diligent in bringing my own children to church, and I'm pretty sure they couldn't tell their St. Catherine of Alexandria from their St. Catherine of Siena, but that's not to say they aren't being indoctrinated in the values of the ruling class's faith. When my daughters were around six and seven, they started French classes at a children's library in our borough. I'd been to our local library countless times, but had mainly confined myself to the infant section and our older children's books were something of a revelation. The entire front desk area was made up of hag hagiographies of Barack Obama and Nelson Mandela. And hagiography is the most accurate term. These books were just like the ones I used to read in church. Here, Blessed Nelson forgave his jailers. Here, St. Barack healed America of its racial sins. And there are just a couple, these are just a couple of examples. It was a bit of a surprise learning just how much the tone of kids' books had changed since I was young and we wore onions on our belts. Nowadays, progressive politics is ever present in children's books, which is fine if you're a believer. But if you're a conservative, you're faced with raising your children in a culture which is filled with messages you disagree with, sometimes misleading, sometimes anecdotally true, but not representative, often just anti-wisdom, giving children the worst possible advice in life. And it's becoming worse since about 2016. Children's books have grown way more explicitly political. Last month, a friend went to the Tate Modern and took a picture of the young children's section. Among the books on display are biographies of Greta Thunberg, something called Queer Heroes, another work called The Rainbow Flag, books about refugees, and the best-selling Goodnight Book for Rebel Girls, and its countless imitators. Whether you support it or not, this is propaganda. The aim is to raise a generation of progressive just as those lives of the saints were designed to bring forth young Christians. And it works. Conservative ideas are very much in retreat, the subject of a brilliant new book I recently read, which admittedly I also wrote. From a very young age, children are read books and shown films that teach them the core progressive messages. They were all basically good and only behave badly because of circumstances, that borders and barriers are bad, stereotypes are wrong, and girls ought to adopt traditional male gender roles if they want to be re respected. Stereotype inaccuracy is a popular idea, and a false one, in so many kids' stories the unusual stranger or alien or wild animal who turns up in the neighborhood will defy the small-minded pessimist who expects the worst. 
When it comes to gender politics, no self-respecting children's book in the 21st century has girls aspiring toward being a princess and living happily ever after. To the post-ironic upper-middle-class parents who are the publisher's main audience, that would just be lame. Would Yeah. There's nothing wrong with all of this, of course, and as a parent, it's a relief when daughters move on from the pinky princess fairy stage of cartoons and onto the more thoughtful stuff that questions gender ter- stereotypes. That questioning is a natural part of growing up, and books open their minds to potentially endless possibilities before they reach maturity and realize that gender identity matches biological sex in the vast majority of cases, because it does. Unfortunately, our culture has become stuck in this adolescent stage of late. In other words, we're stuck in the exploring, exploring all the endless possibilities (laughs) at some point you choose. Um... My in-laws kept dozens of books from the 1970s and early 80s, which we read to our kids along with more recent ones. The general difference in tone was noticeable, progressive themes being almost totally absent in the older books. My naughty little sister is naughty simply because she's a bloody nuisance and it's not really celebrated either as some non-conforming high-status trait. She's not a rebel girl, she's just annoying. Of course, the Talmud of progressive children's literature is the Harry Potter series, preaching of a boy born to freedom fighter parents who's had the bad luck to be brought up in a stultifying conservative Surrey suburb by his dully conventional uncle and aunt. After the geeky open-minded protagonist is allowed to go to wizard school, what follows is a battle between two worldviews, that of the snake-like Slytherin house, which favors the pure-blooded and aristocratic, and the inclusive Gryffindor house, kind-hearted and welcoming to people of all backgrounds. The values in children's books have changed over the past few decades because society has undergone a revolution in values. But as with previous revolutions in France and Russia, and with the earlier Protestant Reformation too, the process has sped up with its own momentum. The revolutions of 1789 and February 1917 are followed by more extreme jolts. Luther is followed by Calvin and Munster. So after decades of accelerating social change during the 2010s, there was a marked and radical shift, especially among the English-speaking upper middle class christened the Great Awakening. The term is a play on the Great Awakening of the 18th century religious revival in the United States, and the name is apt, since the movement has an obviously religious feel. Sacralizing victim groups and inspiring extreme hostility towards non-believers, heretics, and apostates. Indeed, poor old J.K. Rowling has herself been partly eaten by the revolution after revealing herself to be a gender-critical feminist. And so, with this great movement, there has been a proliferation of books for young children that aim to instill progressive politics and promote those most sacred of issues, women's empowerment and racial equality, equality, and to a lesser extent, gay and trans rights. There are now children's books in the States with such names as A is for activists, D is for dreamers, and W is for welcome, a celebration of America's diversity, as well as large numbers pushing the gender is social construct narrative, such as one of a kind, like me, Unico Como Yo, about a boy who wants to dress up as a princess. Britain is embroiled in the revolution, too. I remember two Christmases ago, almost every girl between 8 and 13 in my part of London received a copy of that best-selling Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls from some well-meaning relative. My elder daughter received two. The publishing industry has since cashed in on telling stories of heroic, often overlooked females. Parents can feel good that they are raising their offspring to be firm believers, woke babies who will raise their fists in the air, cry out for justice, and grow up to change the world. The book A is for Activists promises it promises it is written and illustrated for the next generation of progressives, as we read before. Families who want their kids to grow up in a space that is unapologetic about activism, environmental justice, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, and everything else that activists believe in and fight for. Except, of course, individuality, liberty, freedom of speech, nonconformity, acceptance of people who disagree with you. But I digress. There has also been a proliferation of political biographies for young children, including picture books about not only Obama or Mandela, but Latino Judge Sonia Sotomayor and even Elizabeth Warren. Likewise, over here, there's a book about Remainer pinup Lady Hale called Equal to Everything, Judge Brenda and the Supreme Court. It's not that I oppose children reading about Lady Hale or Elizabeth Warren. It's more that I couldn't even comprehend why anyone would wish for their children to do so. Unless there were true believer- believers of a progressive new religion of kick-ass women, boys who want to be girls, and visionaries who heal people of their racism sickness. I'm not. And seeing children's books being turned into a sort of religion, I feel like a 10-year-old again, wishing I could just be reading the X-Men rather than sat in church. And there it is, folks. These books are a form of religion. They are teaching a new religion. It is not nonconformity. It is a new kind of conformity. It is not about tolerance and acceptance and diversity. It is about intolerance towards anything that disagrees with this particular worldview and vision of people. It is anti-individualist. It is anti-choice. 
because what if the girl wants to grow up and be a typical woman, marry, have kids, maybe get a typically traditionally female job, or just be a mom? That's not really an option in these books. So there's a tremendous amount of pressure for the kids who read these things, just as there was a tremendous amount of pressure for the kids who are raised in strict religious households that you conform or you will not be accepted. You will not be loved. All I would ask is for the people who are buying these books and reading these books and giving these books to their two and three-year-olds to consider the possibility that maybe their children are individuals in their own right and don't want to grow up with mommy and daddy's opinions shoved into their brains before they can even speak. Never mind, read. And that's the video for today.